I did. Did it, did it. I think we are live at the moment, but um, as soon as Karen gives you're live. Phone... Oh, so shall we? Shall we start? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, go right. Lovely. Let's do this then. Do not fear, Saf is here, and this is Saf Buxy from Saf Surgery. And welcome, welcome to Real Talk, uh, tragedy to triumph for speak up and empower. And I'm here every Thursday with a, with with usually a, a guest that can inspire us, um, that can tell us a story, that can give us a message of hope. We are on the Speak Up in, and Empower platform, and we are Real Talk, tragedy to triumph. And I don't like to say I'm a host or here. I'm more like to say I'm, a, I'm, I'm someone who would like to have a chat with interesting people. And wow, do I have um, an inspirational friend uh, uh, on, on the show tonight. Um, her name is Christine. She's from North of England in the UK in a place called Leeds, if you're not aware of that, because I know this is global. Um, and her story is remarkable, but what's more remarkable is how she's come through the other side. So without further ado, please, welcome, 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 Christine Wright. How are you? Hi, Seth. I'm very well. Thank you. It, 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 Feeling it, so blessed to be here. Oh, oh well, you look, you look great. Um, we've, you've been on my radio show, Seth Surgery, yeah. and, and, and your story was so humble uh it was so powerful for me um it, it was a no-brainer for me to have you on this show uh today so i'm grateful i'm blessed and not so much to hear your story again but that, that other people are going to hear your story and it's going to give a message of strength a message of hope uh to other people out there so let's let, let's have a little chat um Tell me, we'll, we'll start wherever you want to start, Christine, just, and I'll just come in and in and out as and when. Oh, well, I think last time when we spoke, my my journey really began um, when I was 14. And that was when my parents divorced. That really affected me um, to a really, really deep level to the extent of I started drinking alcohol at 14 years old to kind of numb the pain and the fears of what will be happening with me my family's breaking my family unit was breaking up so obviously that that caused so much um unknown particularly at 14 I was going through you know school still and um I really didn't know how to how to adapt to that so what I did is I, I took to the alcohol also because I knew um, I felt to blame for mum and dad's divorce. There was a lot of things um, which I said um, to both parties. So I felt a lot of blame was put on my shoulders at such a young age. Um, so throughout that whole journey, so we went to court. Obviously, I had a court liaison officer. Um, like I said, I was drinking, I was lying to the law of court, the courts, because I was so afraid of upsetting my parents individual as individuals. I was so, so worried about my loyalties to each of them. So therefore I would lie to one to make it as though everything was okay. And then I'd lie to the other one. It was like, no, I've not seen mom or, you know, cause I didn't want to upset my dad. Um, so that really 14, was 14 okay. years old, Christine. That is such a difficult position to be in. It's like you you are literally stuck in the middle, aren't you? Between yeah, the I was parents. massively stuck in the middle. And at that point, that's when Mum actually left. She left the marital home. Um, so therefore, it was just my dad and my sister. And my sister, she then took on the role of Mum, not because she wanted to. She was kind of put in that situation because um, Dad used to work away. Um, so yeah, she was three years older than me. So obviously sisters, we had fights and fracards anyway, um, but it was just heightened because then she became right. Well, you can't do this or this is what we're having for dinner. And it was all very much, I had to do what she said. Um, so again, the abandonment issues of mum leaving, 
that was all on my shoulders as well. So I had all that to, to um, deal with. Um, and then it got to a point where dad came home one evening and found out that I'd been to a local nightclub at 15 years old. And he literally said to me, you know, where were you at the weekend? And I, I, I blatantly lied to him. And one thing we knew with dad, you should never, ever lie to him. He commanded respect. Um, and that is the worst thing I could have done because he knew I was blatantly lying. And I stuck to my guns. I was like, no, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. One of his friends had seen me at the nightclub. And he basically, he gave me an ultimatum and he just said, look, you either live by my rules or you're out. And if you're out, you know, don't expect to come back. And if you're out, you go now. You don't go tomorrow when I'm at work. So that Elaine has to deal with it. That's my sister. So I was like, okay, I'll stay, I'll stay. Because obviously I didn't want the confrontation. Even, you know, there was a little bit of a tussle at that point um, before I actually made my choices. So we actually had a tussle, my father and I. And I went off to my bedroom and I phoned my friend and my friend said, right, okay. And she just went, right, my mum's coming to pick you up tomorrow. And that's what happened. Her mum came the next day, picked me up, took me to my mum's house. Um, and that's where I stayed. So I stayed there for a period of time. And throughout that time, again, I came to loggerheads with mum's new partner. I wanted to ask you, Christine, why didn't you go to your mum's initially? Because because uh, both of the sisters, but both of you girls stay with dad. Yeah. What, what, I don't think I've asked you the question. Why didn't no, you go? No, it's because I didn't agree with where mum went. Mum actually went to her part, her new partners. Okay. Um, and uh, there was so many complications towards that. It was the partner was my dad's best friend and it was it was all very oh, very wow. okay yeah so um, you had a lot of resent you had a lot of resentment then I guess yeah to your mom, and of course, to your dad's best friend yeah yeah so it was so literally when my dad did give me that ultimatum and my my best friend best friend's mom came to pick me up um I had no choice I had to go to mum's which as you've just said there, the amount of resentment that I had and the hostility that I had towards this man just didn't gel well in his own house. So again, he gave my mum then an ultimatum. You either stay on your own and she goes, meaning me, and it was literally she. I was never addressed to, addressed by, you know, my name. It was always she or her or... I should be seen but not heard. That was one of his favourite <laughs> favorite sayings. Um, and obviously with that, it was just like, right, okay, mum said no, we're out. So we actually left and that's where the next part of the journey came for me. The next part of the trauma came for me. And that was when we became homeless because we had nowhere to go. So that was, you know, the next stage. We literally... We're living in bed and breakfast and host, host, um, homeless units until we could get some social housing sorted out for us. And this so went on. Uh, am, I, uh, am I right in saying, Christine, so your mum obviously chose you? Yeah. That's yeah. great. So because did you have any doubt that she wouldn't? Obviously, I had the doubt because she walked out initially. Mm. The first, I mean, I remember that night, clear as day, I remember watching, I don't know if the, um, the Canadian audience or the global audience watching, I remember watching Red Dwarf, um, which is a comedy programme on the TV, on UK TV. Hmm. And I just remember her walking out with, with bin liners saying, right, girls, I'm going. And it's, you know, what? I've got to go to school tomorrow. What do you mean you're going? And she just hmm. left. So obviously with that, ultimatum given to mum by her new partner there was always that doubt am I going to be out where do I go then because obviously I would have had no I'd have gone to my friends no doubt I'd have gone to an auntie's because categorically my dad would not have had me back he was too proud he was too proud for that well so you went to your mum's and then she was put in a in a yeah. position where she had to choose 
thankfully she chose yourself, but then you found yourself homeless and uh, yes. in and out of homeless shelters and BMBs and that must have been tough because you're what you're, you're 15 still, are you 15, yes, 16 was, years old? going through my GCSEs, which is the education system through here, so the um, exams. Yeah. So I was going through my major exams um, and the school obviously were aware what was going on and I was very blessed. I went to a very, very good school. They kept me very grounded. They opened, they opened the school early for me so I could go to school for eight o'clock in the morning because that's what time I got kicked out of the bed and breakfast. Um, and they'd leave the school open late anyway um, because I couldn't get back into the bed and breakfast till after five. So throughout that whole period, uh, my studies weren't affected because I had these extra hours either side of the, the day, the school day. Um, and plus, I'd either go to a friend's house as well. So I basically hung out with the nuns um, in my... Oh. Uh, <laughs> so I was hanging out Lovely. with the nuns. So it's pretty cool. They're cool. They were cool ladies. They get a lot of bad press. And we did have a few strict nuns there, but... There was one particular nun who took me under her wing, Sister Catherine, and she was just she was just amazing. Oh. So, so that that really is that part of the journey. So you know, we did then get social housing. We did then get um, a kind of a kind of routine with Mum and I. Um, but throughout this whole process, dad did not speak to me. Dad didn't speak to me for nearly, I think it was about a year and a half, two years. Because um, obviously his pride, he, he was such a proud Yorkshire man that, you know, it was one of his best friends that just turned around and said, do you know what, she's your daughter, you know? Don't do this to her. You'll regret it later on in life. And fortunately for that friend, you know, he actually brought my, my dad and myself back together. So that was pretty cool. So, and I actually met this friend again last, was it two years ago? Um, so a friend of dad's and I, I did say, I said, you know, I'm eternally grateful, eternally grateful for that conversation he had with him because he's a stubborn mule. Mm. So, you know, it worked out in the end. So that was cool. Um, what else do you want to know, Saf? What else well, it's um, a few things happened, didn't it, to you? Um, yes, yeah, so which we, which we know and we've spoken about, which which I do appreciate uh, is quite hard for you to to say. It's it's hard for anyone. Um, I myself, as as you know, have been through um, something that I find hard to talk about. But I've come to a stage in my life, uh, Christine is all the pain that not only have I been through, all the pain that I've caused, um, I have to use that or talk about it or spread the message to people who are either doing it or going through similar kind of pain. And that's what gets me through uh, talking about certain things that, of course, is are quite uncomfortable. Uh, but I know from our previous chat, you're happy. Well, happy, I don't know, but you, you're willing. Um, uh, to, yeah, the thing is, I think it comes down to acceptance and forgiveness. And whether or not that acceptance is, yes, it happened. Um, and the forgiveness of yourself, because, you know, forgive yourself, it wasn't your fault, or there's areas of it that wasn't your fault, or forgive yourself or forgive the other person. So I guess if I take it back to, um, so obviously whilst I was in the homeless units and the BMBs, there was a lot of drugs, there was a lot of alcoholism, there was a lot of um, prostitution, I was opened up. My, my whole, I'm not going to say innocent world, but my, my eyes were opened to what else was out there. Um, and it, was, it wasn't real eye opener. <laughs> it was like, whoa, what's going on here? You know, the, the actual dealing of drugs and the, you know, you could see you know, the, the pimps and things like that going on in the areas where these homeless units were. Um, but from that, when we did move into our social housing, everything was pretty much hunky-dory. I was still drinking to, to suppress 
all the trauma of mum and dad's divorce. Um, but it was more of a drinking to excess. It was binge drinking. So when friends and I used to go out, it would be Christine would be the one who would get the most ridiculously drunk. She would be the one that's a good night's not being had until I was violently sick, because that would then mean I've made way for more alcohol to be consumed. And that is how I literally went about when we went out on an evening out, you know, with the girls, it would be like, right, okay, if I, if I feel sick and I can't be sick, I would make myself sick. Um, and I remember being at this one particular party. Now, I, I would say this is where a, a trigger warning possibly, you know, what I'm going to say, it might affect other people who are watching this and I, I don't want that, I just want to put it out there. What I am going to discuss can be quite quite gut-wrenching and quite heartbreaking, really. And I think when I went to this party, I got absolutely so drunk, it was untrue. And a certain indiv individual who I knew took advantage. And when I mean took advantage, he... He committed a, a very, very violent sexual assault on me. Um, and, you know, everybody else was either comatose, in bed, whatever. But then this, 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 this person, two or three weeks prior to this party, did actually come up to me at another party and uttered the words, I am going to have you. And I just laughed it off there and then at this this party and I just thought you shut up go away you know you're talking ridiculously but I didn't actually think he would pursue and act upon that and he said it more than once at this party and then for it to happen two three weeks later on boxing day so it was the day after Christmas um that absolutely shattered me absolutely shattered me so what I did from there on in is I left the party after it happened um, and I went straight home rather than going to the police rather than waking anybody up rather than trying to get some help I think I was so disgusted with myself I, I was so shameful that it had happened and I thought well who's going to believe me because I'm crazy Christine, I'm always a girl that gets so drunk, who's going to believe me? But to this day, I can tell you exactly what I had on, I can tell you exactly what time it happened. You know, there's so much um, clarification in my head, that the smells, the everything, even the area where it happened, I have to do a detour, so I'll take the long way around this particular area, um, so I don't have to pass that certain house where it happened, because it just sends shivers down my spine um, and sends me all goose pimply because I just, it's just one of those things, it's just another thing to, okay, well that happened and deal with it. Christine, I'm, um, this is the second time I'm hearing this and and I've worked <clears throat> in sex offender wings in, in prison service as a, as a drug and alcohol practitioner. And I found that very uncomfortable, but I'm actually, my, my stomach is churning. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually feeling a bit sick uh, listening to what happened to you. And I, I, it's, there's nothing I can really say. Um, well, the reason we're talking about it, Saf, is to, to say to others, you know, Yes, this happened to me, but look, I'm still here. I'm still, yeah. it's made, it's shaped who I am today. And, you know, I put out something today and it said something, you know, I live a life of no regret. You know, I could have regretted that evening by saying, do you know what? I shouldn't have had that much to drink. I shouldn't have consumed that much alcohol. I shouldn't have gone to that party. There's all those types of things that you can think and it wasn't until last year when I had a lot of healing, self-healing, where I actually forgave myself. You know, it's, it's not your fault. 
it's not your fault accept what happened don't ever disregard it because by doing that you're disregarding a piece of you and I think every inch of every person is so precious regardless of good bad ugly whatever because it is that foundation that shapes you as a person and I I truly believe you know we can heal we can heal from such things like that there is light and there is hope and Yes, I do get a little bit quivery, you know, when I talk about it, but it's it's my story. People need to understand that there is there is a good ending. You make your own ending. There is a good ending. And there's people out there who can help you make your good ending, who can help you um, find it what it is that you may need to recover or you know, and mine was my healing last year. I thought I recovered pretty much okay from it because I boxed and filed and that was it. I could carry on the rest of the year. I could function, but come to December, the 1st of December, that's where I'd start to crumble. That's where I'd consume more alcohol because that's where I knew I was counting down the days. Um, and obviously, as a parent, December is all about being happy for the children. You've got to be Mrs. Claus. You've got to be all this kind of woman to make sure that the children don't see any suffering. And that's what I did. I lived all, through all that, you know, happy, jolly, but still consuming the alcohol to try and quash and numb what happened on that particular day and last just want, speak about, just want to speak about that night very quickly christy without going into too much detail you went home mm. what did you do when you went home did you tell your mother did you have a shower? i think you, you mentioned it what, what, yeah, what, what I, do you yeah i walked home so it was literally it was a huge walk it's about three it was about three miles that i walked late at night um, early hours actually so it had been early hours of the 28th and I got home and mum was already in bed um, so I told her woke her up um, I was in the bath and I, that's where I was I was in the bath actually I was in the bath for hours and it was you know mum was like what's going on and because I told mum what had happened now this is where the real trauma came mum didn't do anything about it and that again just solidified my whole reasoning of not speaking to my friends that night when it happened not going to the police um it just kind of well, if my mum's not even doing anything about it, what chances are the police are going to do anything about it? Because I was drunk, because um, I didn't cry for help. I, you know, I remember the actual incident. Yes, I tried to fight it and warn him off, but the more I fought, the more violent he became. And in the end, I just thought, you know what, just, just, just lay here and just take it. Let him just do. The quicker he finishes, the quicker I can go. And that is pretty much how that evening, that, that, that event panned out. Um, and that's really what happened and going into going into the bath and scrubbing and making sure that I had no trace of him on me because he, made, he literally did make my skin crawl, just the thought of him and mum not doing anything. I just thought, well, what is the point? I'm just going to sit in the bath. And that's what I did. I just literally sat there for hours, went into my bedroom and stayed into my bedroom for a long time. So sorry to hear this. Um, I mean, if, if... If, if there's someone out there who's been through something similar or may happen to them, what would you advise them, Christine? Um, because you didn't go to the police, you told your mum, you, you, the confidence wasn't there in telling anyone else because 
it was like your mom didn't not once say she didn't believe you but she didn't do anything about it uh, what would you tell someone in a similar situation or of experience no, definitely it's not your fault do not take that blame and that responsibility on your shoulders it is not your fault they are violating you um so and most definitely contact the police literally <laughs> don't do what i did do not get rid of any trace or any evidence um go straight to the police and inform them and what about just... for someone who feels like you possibly felt you know, uh... You had, you had a, <clears throat> a reputation for drinking and having a good time at parties. So they might think, oh, people are not going to believe me. They might say to themselves, well, I was drunk. Uh, maybe I asked for it. Cause that does go in them people, women's minds, wrongly so, but it does. Not just women and men, who does, it's not about that. What do you say to those people who may feel or think the way you thought? Um. I would still say the same, Saf. It's lit, you know, these people are here to help us. These people are here to, and we shouldn't be judged as women or as men who are affected by this. We should not be judged. And I think that's a big thing. And the part we, partly why we speak about traumas like this is to get rid of the stigma and the judgment. Um, but I do believe that do go to the police, do speak to, I mean, if it is, mine was in a party, I should have literally woke the house up and said, look, this is what's going on. Um, and then you're getting advice from other people as well. They will, you know, be like, right, okay, we are doing this. So you wouldn't have to deal with it on your own. Um, but what I want to say is, regardless of how much alcohol you've consumed, regardless of what you're wearing, regardless of how you're acting, the person who's committed that crime is the one that is out of order. It's not you. The dress sense, the dress, what I was wearing, my outfit, it was down to my ankles. I had, a, you know, it was, it was literally, there was nothing provocative there. And even so, if you are wearing something provocative, and this is what this is what really gets my go, even if you are wearing something provocative, it does not give the entitlement of another human being to go and access or treat your body as something sexual. It, it just comes down to it can, respect and things like that. And it is often the victim who is the bad one in a situation. You know, they are often portrayed in the wrong light and that is not this is something that it shouldn't be like that it's it frustrates me as well when someone says oh look but she was asking for it or she was yeah. wearing that or she walked down that alley on her own it really upsets me because yeah. you should be allowed to walk walk where you want to walk wear what you want to wear without being judged um okay yes i mean sometimes i mean girl or boy i yeah. would think twice about walking in the alleyway at, at five in the morning so that's just common sense, but no one is asking for an act like that to happen. I didn't ask for half the stuff that happened to me. You did not ask for that, Christine. And anyone who's been through what you've been through or I've been for whatever is has not asked and will not be asking for it. So your advice is please, please, please go to the police immediately. Well, re reach out to somebody who you can talk to. You know, I I thought you know, as a child, your mum is your protector, your father is your protector. At that time, my dad and I, we didn't have the relationship. My mum became my protector, but she had so many other mental health issues going on in her own world because of the whole situation with dad, boyfriend, homeless, um, which I know I spoke to you about before, Saf, you know, me going through my own divorce, I could relate now as an adult how mum felt and how she dealt with that situation unfortunately this absolutely horrendous act happened to me when mum wasn't at her best and you know I should have reached out to to other people and I didn't I chose not to my friends I told them eventually and they were supportive but again well, what's the point in going to the police a week later when you've 
washed all the evidence away and you just think well and I didn't know but funnily enough it's not funny actually the wrong phrase I actually reported the rape last May oh right okay okay so, I reported it. I didn't act. I didn't ask them to go action it. It's just been reported. So, you know, so the police are aware and they said to me, right, Christine, if you want us to pursue, just let us know. And that was good enough for me. I've told the police. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So that, that, that unfortunate, extremely unfortunate and sad night has gone. Yeah. How was your life thereafter? How did you move on Christine how does one move on from this from that I would say I started drinking very heavily again because trauma trauma I picked up the bottle and the bottle would be anything I could get my hands on south I'm not gonna lie I wasn't as as educated as what I was last year or this year with wines and gin it was literally anything I could get my hands on I would be drinking um and I also took that opportunity to move away from home. I actually went to university. So I went to go live in Manchester in the UK um, to study hotel management with tourism. And I did that for a period of four years. So it was a four year course which meant that I got to go live abroad with it as well. So I actually lived in Cyprus, had an amazing time in Cyprus, um, came back home and found out, well, came back home and basically met the man of my dreams. So I met my Mr. Right. Um, after saying I'd never get married, I'd never have children, I'd never um, commit to anything because I wanted to be a free spirit, I wanted to see the world, um, I actually met my Mr. Right, and after six weeks of dating him, he asked me to marry him, and I said yes. And it was like, that was so far out. It's, all my friends were like, what? You were the that, one. That wasn't in the script, it seems. That was <laughs> totally not in the script. You were the one going, I'm never having children, I'm never getting married. I was just so anti conforming to social requirements and things like this is what you should be doing you know all my girlfriends were getting married they were having children I'm like I'm not having any of that none of that um and there I was six weeks later saying yes I'll marry you so I obviously got into this relationship we had two children two beautiful boys um and I started climbing the corporate ladder um, with a career in hospitality and very similar he he also did that as well um, so have, everything was just hunky-dory at that time I, I couldn't have lived a better life you know I kind my relationship with my father had come back together and um, he was the most amazing granddad you know um, my relationship was mum with mum was fixed my you know everything just seemed white picket fence and everything else it was the dream and um then I had some crushing news that my husband was having an affair and that completely traumatized me no end I probably suffered more with that than the actual sexual act that was carried out on me that that really did scar me to no end that was where I really struggled with who I became who I became so you know we tried to go to a counseling and there were things coming out like she's just the the mother of the children I don't see her as a anything sexual I don't see her as anything you know inspirational I don't you know there was just no commitment coming nothing nice coming out of his mouth and I was like oh my gosh, you were my world and you've just completely crushed it because he kind of made everything that had happened to me safe. He became my 
maybe savior is a wrong word, but I, I totally changed everything to be with him. And it just completely, it just completely crushed me because I thought this guy who was my protector, who would look after me and who would, you know, be the perfect father, be the perfect husband. And not that I should have put that emphasis on him, but everybody in our social circle were like, oh my gosh, you know, you're the perfect couple. You're, the, you, you, you're creating such amazing job roles for yourself and your children are, you know, go to private school and everything was just so hunky-dory. And to find out and for him to say it was just a bit of fun, just blew me apart, just blew me away. If he had, if he had willingly, or it looks like, if he had wanted to make a change, you would still be with him today, I guess. But um, he, showed, he showed no intention. He, and... No, I found out in the February, um, or there were, there, were the, there were the noises in the February, or well, there were the noises of, just check his phone, just do this. That was in the December. And then in the February, that's when I find, found out that something untoward was going on. Um, and it all started to come out. And I didn't, I actually left the family home with the boys. So we left in the September. So from the February to the September, that period of time is when we tried to make it work with the counselling. Um, but it was all on my part, there was no way, I think he was just doing the counseling just to try and appease me and say, look, you know, I'm giving it a go, but it just didn't work. And, you know, I still have a very good relationship with him now. We still talk, we still, you know, speak about the children. Um, so that relationship still is there. And that's how I always wanted it to be because I didn't want the divorce of what John and I would be going through to affect the boys like my mum and dad's divorce affected me. So that was that was crucial. That was one of the fundamental things I said. I says that is no way going to happen. And that's something that we agreed on. You know, the boys best interests. Were... Tough journey you've had. Yeah. Tough journey. And then and then throughout that, so from that um from the January, no, the February to the September, when we were trying to work it out, I found out in that process that I was pregnant. Um, and unfortunately, I lost that baby. I had an ectopic pregnancy, um, which had ruptured. So it was, it was touch and go. So it was like, okay, there you go. There's your trip to the hospital. And... Yeah, that was that was tough to deal with having to come out of that situation to go back home to be in the marital home with everything crumbling around you and still be again that that joyous that mum role but being incredibly ill as well not just mentally but also physically that that was really a testing time so this is um powerful stuff and it's I'm, I'm getting quite emotional here because everything that you've been through from the age of 14, 15, up until this moment has, and it, it, there were there were parts of it where you thought, this is it now, everything's sorted, everything, but life is perfect. Life was amazing. You amazing. Know? And then uh, it went backwards again. But, you know, and I guess at that time, staff, I was very... I was emotionally crippled, I would say, at that point. I was, there was no, there was no sense of purpose. I would probably say, that's probably the best way of, of putting it out there. There was, at one particular point, there was no sense of purpose, which is, you know, even though I had two beautiful children, I had my own business at this point, so I had a business as well. Um, Everything just came, it was just like a big crescendo. It was just coming down. And I just thought, well, what is the point? What is the point, you know? And that's where you start analysing what has gone on 
through my life or through my life. That's why I said, well, this has happened and this is that. And I started to play the victim. And that's not healthy in any way, shape or form. It, and I literally, at this point as well, I was also opened up to the law of attraction and, um, you know, thinking abundantly and, you know, a book which I read religiously is The Secret by Rhonda Byrne. Um, I kind of, I was given this book throughout this whole period, this, this complete stranger came up to me and she says, I think you need this book. Didn't know her. She had this book in her hand. So it was absolutely some divine intervention there. Again, you have to read this book. And to this day, I have that very, very same book that she gave me. So I started reading it, but I still wasn't absorbing what the words were saying to me in the book. I was still very much in victim modality and can't cope, I can't cope. What is the point? You know, I've lost my marriage, so I'm a failure as a wife. So that means I'm a failure as a mum because I've not kept the, the household together. I'm also a failure as a mum because I wasn't able to give birth to this baby girl. Um, I'm, you know, a failure as a daughter because my dad didn't speak to me. So even the old trauma started coming back, um, which meant drinking, drinking, drinking. And it got to the point where I literally drove off one night and sat with a glass, a bottle of Jack Daniels and proceeded to take some paracetamol with it. And that's where I was in. I was in complete despair and I was in this car park um, which overlooked a beautiful um, water um, it, and a reservoir, you know, I was there and, and I know I spoke to you about this before, you know, that the, I am writing the book and the book is, you know, the, um, the accidental dogger because I was actually found myself in a dogging car park mm. trying to end my life when around me I've got cars that were coming and going and they were come in, in euphoria and I was in complete despair. And it wasn't until, you know, I, I don't, I can't even tell you at what point I looked up and I noticed what was going on, but I knew I can't die here. I can't die. I can't die in a dogging car park. So I drove, even after having um, some Jack Daniels and a few pills, I drove to where my studio was. And that's where I proceeded to take a few more pills. But at that point, a friend of mine saw the light on. I shared this studio with her. She came in, she made me puke up and get everything out of my system phoned my friend we must not, we must have a fear of phoning the relevant people because there was no ambulances called there was no no medical assistance called it was just like right okay phone your friend and that's that's where I stayed that evening I literally stayed with her and the next day I got a phone call from husband saying where are you you need to get your ass home you've got a family to look after and I've got to go to work and then that was it. That was like, right, okay, I am now mum. I have to become a mum, you know? Forget what the trauma's going on in my head and my mind. I have to be here for my children. And that really, that really was the, the turning point, I think. But do you know what? You, you don't even care. You don't even care about me because if you did, you'd offer to get me some help or you'd apologize for what you've done, or you'd try and make the family unit work. And that's when I left. That's when I decided, do you know what, boys? We're going. And that's what we're we We're out of here. We're out of here, as we said. We're out of here. And again, it was party of three then, me and the boys. Um, so. Um, I want to move forward to something that happened on a bridge that I'm dying for you to tell everyone, because I think that was a pivotal moment in it was, the person you definitely are today yeah uh, which i guess probably gave you a purpose in life 
that was my purpose. What, you know, I had to go all through this trauma and meeting Danny, the chap that I met on the bridge. So it ba basically, I, I had a pull. I was driving, I had a pull of having to be somewhere and I didn't know where that somewhere was. So we've kind of bypassed a whole host of events to get to this event because this is the pivotal bit. And I literally was driving past this bridge, saw a gent out the corner of my eye, and I thought he looks really troubled. Carried on. And I drove past him, but the, the pull inside of me was like, how would you feel if you found out that somebody had jumped off that bridge, you saw them and you didn't do anything about it? And I remember driving going, I can't have that, can't have that. I can't, I can't, I can't hold that guilt of driving past somebody. So I turned back round and that's where, by this point, he was over the other side of the railings, ready to go. And I literally ran out of the car and bear hooked him. Now, it could have gone one of two ways. Fortunately, it went the right way. I'm here telling the story. And I pulled him back over the railings. The, the strength was just, I can't even tell you where that strength came from. And I pulled him back over and I cradled him. And we sat there on the floor for literally 25 minutes. And he was crying. I was crying. I was listening to him. And... It, he basically felt worthless. He was an alcoholic. He had just lost his father. I just lost my father, so I could relate to the grief. Um, he'd just broken up from a relationship, so I could, again, relate to that because I'd broken up from a relationship. Um, and he felt as though he had no worth. So I was just listening to cradling him. The emergency services came and they then took him away and I was like but where are you taking him and they said no we're going to take him to um oh they took him to some medical I don't think they took him to hospital but he went under some medical care and I phoned the hospital the next day saying look I'm looking for this chap I actually phoned the police officer that was the officer on the scene and, but they couldn't relay any information to me because they had personal, you know, confidentiality. Um, and it wasn't until I thought, right, okay, I need to do something here. You know, there's so many people who are feeling worthless, who are drinking too much, who are getting themselves into situations something has to be done. And again, I was drinking so heavily at this point, I was drinking maybe a bottle of wine a night, if not two some nights. And I made it there and then. I thought, right, I'm not drinking anymore. I need to do something about it. So there and then, probably in the March. So this happened in the January, back end of January. By the 1st of March, I had set up a business called Habit Breakers. By the 31st of March, I had stopped trading in my florist shop which had another year on the lease. I stopped trading there. I just honoured my events. And I set up a business to help people break away from unhealthy habits and regain and master new healthier habits, which is what I do now. It's, it's incredible that um, when you save someone's life, they actually saved your life. Which is exactly what we, I mean, people say to me, Saf, they say, you know what, Christine, you are his earth angel. You saved this man. And I actually turn it around. I spin it on its head and I go, actually, he saved me. He saved me because he stopped me doing a job which I always thought would be my passion. I was always very passionate about floristry. I was always, I am, you know, I was very good at my job. Um. But he saved me from just doing something quite mundane. And I'm not saying that floristry is mundane. I'd done it for 20 years. I needed, I was actually looking at a different way of developing that floristry business, which is why then it was easier for me to say, do you know what? 
I'm not going to do floristry anymore. I am going to do this and I'm going to create a business where we can have, you know, a really motivational community, which will help so many, you know, on my, my passion statement is, you know, to help over 1 million disconnected soul to find empowering, you know, their empowerment beliefs and things like that. And, you know, and, it's been good for me. It's been cathartic for me because I've been able to go through my healing processes. I've been able to reach out to people who I then invite into my business and they are my panel of experts. So whatever I use in my business, I've got a panel of experts because I've used them and they've got me through my traumas as well. And that's really, really what we do. And it's, you know, it's lovely to see, it's lovely to see the, the transitions that people that go through it, you know, it's, I have had, even though it is for habit breaking and fundamentally geared around the alcohol, I've had people in there who have had gambling habits, um, you know, eating, they want to cut out the sugar, they want, even right down to procrastination and things like that, how can you help me do this, anything but help me live my best life which is what our motto is live your best life so well, you could have you could have quite easily have reached a, a million people just from this today um and and where it's going to go out in the future your story has has touched me christine just like it touched me the first time if not more um if you had any last words to say to someone out there what would your what would your last words be i, I always love to finish on some last words um a lot of my belief believe that you are worthy don't feel worthless you know and talk talking is key absolutely key no matter how you're feeling it might be a project at work that is really annoying you distressing you it might be some trauma that you're going through it might be boredom you know just talk, talk to people. There's no reason why we should be silenced, why you can't reach out to people, particularly in the mental health remit. You know, don't, don't suffer alone. Don't suffer alone because there's people out there who want to help you. It's not that they have to, they want to help you. Um, mm. And just believe because however bad things may be, you can turn it around you can transition it around and you can be, you can live your best life. You know? With your, wow, with your wow, 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 so, wow. What a powerful message you've given us today, Christine. This has been real talk. It's real talk with real people and you are one, one real person. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your story, for sharing your journey. Um, some parts have been very uncomfortable for you, for me, and it will be for many people who are watching today mm. um, and who will be watching in the future. But I'd like to thank you for the reasons why you have disclosed so much because it's the same reasons why I've had you on the show is to give a message of hope to so many people. So thank you very much, Christine. Um, thank you, sir. For blessed and grateful to know you and, and hopefully you'll be part of Speak Up and Empower in, 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 you know, in, in the future as well. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, um, for another powerful show. Um, Real Talks, tragedy to triumph, and it really has been in, in Christine's case. Um, we're on every Thursday, um, 8 p.m. UK time, 3 p.m. Eastern time, Canada. Um, thank you, and, and God bless, and you know what? Keep communicating keep talking reach out reach out because i think we don't talk enough um and because of that things happen and things get away uh so just as christine said talk reach out believe in yourself you are not worthless you are worthy um and and, and god bless so thank you very much and where is karen we need karen to come back and to say goodbye to us um I'm sure she'll be here in a minute. Uh, just while we're waiting for Karen. Oh, she's here. Hi, Karen. Hi. Thank you so much. 
and you can yeah. always hear the background noise. <laughs> I sort of cut it out because we are all over the place right now. There's lots of people. Sorry, there's lots of people uh, watching. We are so blessed to have had you here, Christine, to share your story. I know you and me are going to talk more. Um, you know, real talks, real conversations. Um, we shape the way you live and how you should live at Speak Up and Empower. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. www.speakupandempower.com. You can watch us Thank everywhere you. on YouTube. Thank you. Cheers.